Appendix A of Garibaldi and the Making of Italy by George Macaulay Trevelyan. The Russell Manuscripts. By the great kindness of Mr. Rollo Russell, to whom, as to his sister, Lady Agatha Russell, I am much indebted for materials for the history of 1859 and 1860. I have been allowed to see the private correspondence with Italy of Lord John Russell while Secretary of Foreign Affairs. I have spoken on pages 28 through 30 above of the very great importance of these private letters, more particularly those of Henry Elliot, the British minister at Naples, and Sir James Hudson, the British minister at Turin. We see in them the process by which British statesmen were induced during the course of Garibaldi's expedition of 1860 to accept the idea of Italian unity, contrary to their previous views and intentions. Russell, Palmerston, and Gladstone had long been friends of Italian liberty, but they did not see that unity was the condition of liberty until they were convinced by events and by the letters of Hudson and Elliot who were themselves converted to the doctrine of unity only by Garibaldi's success in Sicily. The following extracts and analysis will interest the student, and even, I think, the general reader. 1860, May 1st, Hudson to Russell, from Turin. Garibaldi still at Quarto, preparing to sail for Sicily. I feel convinced that both France and Austria mean mischief, France will not tolerate the substantial aggrandizement of this country and its institutions, and Austria yet dreams of reconquest. If you abstain in Sicily and at Naples, Italy, in my opinion, has not much chance of being left to the Italians. May 4th, Hudson to Russell. Two days before Garibaldi sailed. Hudson encloses a letter of Mr. Fenton's from Florence dated May 2nd, narrating on fairly reliable evidence that Victor Emmanuel at Florence had said that he would be at Naples before the end of the year. Hudson comments, I quite believe that he is capable of saying so, because when he received a sword of honor from the Romans, he said, and Ramo Alfondo, and because also he is in the habit of blurting out just what happens to be present in his mind at the moment. May 18th, Hudson to Russell. Garibaldi in Sicily, not yet in Palermo, three days after Calatafimi. Hudson advises against the union of North and South Italy because, one, Naples cannot be ruled from Turin or Florence with the Papal States intervening. This objection of Hudson's was removed in September when the Piedmontese overran and annexed the Papal marches and Umbria. Two, the Neapolitans are too corrupt and the entire civil and military administration is so abominable that their jurisdiction with North Italy, where honesty is the rule in public affairs, would merely produce a social decomposition and then a political putrefaction. We must therefore, argues Hudson, find a meso termine in order to arrive at the end Russell desires, viz. to check the Marat party and the French designs on South Italy. The mezzo termine recommended by Hudson is a prince of the House of Savoy on the throne of Naples and Sicily, guaranteed by France and England. This is to be got by amicable representation at Naples by France and England, which would result in either the grant of a constitution or an abdication. Either would do, but the latter would be best, for then a prince of the House of Savoy might be put into the vacant throne. I believe Cavour heartily desires an Anglo-French intervention at Naples. I cannot go and speak to him on the subject, but I have caused him to be sounded, and I have myself sounded some of the best and wisest heads on the matter. The above is the result. Here we see that as late as May 18, 1860, Hudson himself was not in favor of Italian unity. May 27, Hudson to Russell the day Garibaldi entered Palermo. I received your telegram this morning instructing me to ask Cavour to stop any more expeditions from Genoa and Tuscany. He told me some days ago he would not permit any repetition of the Garibaldi expedition, and I believe him. If so, Hudson was unusually credulous, for Cavour was at the moment helping his friends to fit out the expedition of Medici. May 31st, Hudson to Russell first day of the armistice at Palermo. 
hudson discusses whether there is truth in the rumors that italy will make further concessions of territory to france in return for venice or the south cavour denies it and hudson believes him for my part my belief is based not upon cavour but on cavour's necessities you speak of cavour as though he were the dictator but he depends on public opinion the deputies supported him in the session of savoy because they knew they must pay france for central italy and because the greater part of nice is french in population and savoy is as reactionary as ireland or the vatican but he could not command fifty volts to give away sardinia or genoa the king told me that he had made the sacrifice of savoy and nice with a heavy heart but there was no means of avoiding it he added that he had paid his shot to france and he would hang the first minister who proposed to make another session supposing the king's word is worth no more than cavour's why should venice be worth genoa in my opinion genoa is the real tete du pont of the king of sardinia's dominions to give genoa means to give spezia in which case there is no italy at all and the italians have no intention of changing an austrian master for a french one cavour and ferrini were here with me for an hour last night they went over the whole question of italy and her independence they came here with a telegram announcing the fall of palermo i did not detect a word which smacked of further sessions to france but i perceive very clearly that the more you hang back the more easy do you make the propagation of french notions in italy upon whom can the constitutional party in italy lean on save upon us and if we refuse to allow them to lean upon us you force them to lean upon france consequently if you abstain from interference in some shape or other in these sicilian movements you leave a free field to france june second elliot to russell from naples during our mistis at palermo it is extremely fortunate that the protest of the admiral mundi against the bombardment was not listened to for if it had been abandoned on that account the success of insurgents would indubitably have been put upon our shoulders but nevertheless as it was not listened to i am delighted that the protest should have been made i do not feel much fear that the bombardment will be renewed but it was charming to see how his defence was taken up by the nuncio who gesticulated in favour of shells and shrapnel till his purple stockings got almost scarlet with excitement july tenth elliot to russell more than a month after the fall of palermo elliot says he is favourable to complete annexation by piedmont either by means of garibaldi continuing his career of victory as he will do if the sicilian settlement is delayed till he has crossed the straits or else as elliot would prefer by piedmont declaring open war on the house of bourbon if piedmont would come forward openly and say that she intends to take up arms for her sicilian brothers i think it would simplify matters much for the whole concern would probably tumble down without much further trouble and it would moreover be an infinitely more manly and credible course the treaty ceding sardinia and genoa to france is apocryphal and comes from vienna but false rumours as elliot have often preceded such objectionable pretensions of france july sixteenth hudson to russell from turin four days prior to the battle of Milazzo, the unionists of north and central italy that hold policy because they see in it their principal means of escape from all foreign influence and for my part i cordially and entirely agree with them for the very same reason that heretofore i advocated the annexation of tuscany because now that the notion of a prince of the house of savoy has been set aside by the force of circumstances i do see very great danger in the balance of power in the mediterranean if france should in the midst of the neapolitan confusion find a means to place a creature of her own on that throne or on both of the sicilies as to further compensation of france in the event of annexation of one or both of the sicilies cavour exclaimed vehemently only last night i will guarantee that nothing of the sort shall happen i want italy for the italians not for the french i replied that you were of opinion that if he only ran straight all would yet be well and to this he solemnly declared that he would run straight july twenty second farini to russell from turin 
Farini, Cavour's principal colleague, writes solemnly denying rumors circulating in Europe that Italy and France are negotiating for a cession of Sardinia and the Ligurian coast to France. July 31st, Russell to Farini, from Chesham Palace. Sir, I beg to assure you that I entirely believe your denial of the sinister rumors which have been spread but we know that count cavour thought himself compelled to yield contrary to his declarations on the subject at savoy and nice so that many say what happened once may happen again for the present i entirely disbelieve any secret treaty july twenty fifth ricasoli to russell from florence ricasoli writes to thank lord john for his support of the italian cause la regeneration italiane repose uniquement sur son unity vil you lose bien entre persuade my lord il n'est de salut or il europa que dans l'italian nation et il n'est a pas de nation que dans l'unity july twenty seventh hudson to russell garibaldi's army victorious at milazzo on the twentieth is arriving at messina on the straits to state what are the plans of cavour would be to do that which he himself would not dare to attempt for my belief is that he has no plan he is a waiter upon providence and the chapter of accidents the general aspect of affairs is a complete imbroglio for which there would as a choice of evils appear to be no other remedy than annexation if therefore i am an advocate of that principle it is rather because it appears to me to be less prejudicial to the british interests of which you remind me that the anarchy of sicily and naples and the discontent of northern italy july twenty eighth Elliot to russell three or four days after la Chieta's visit to russell's house di martino is evidently much vexed that you will not join in preventing garibaldi from crossing the straits though i scarcely think he can have really expected that you would as I have over and over again told him, not to reckon on any such help. July 31st, Hudson to Russell, Garibaldi still at Messina. A long-reasoned letter to prove that the unity of Italy is in accordance with British interests. To constitute Italy under duality is not easy with public opinion opposed. I was then a dualist. I continued to be so till the capture of Palermo i then proposed a prince of the house of savoy you received the notion coldly and did nothing to promote it the tidal wave of unity which the victory of palermo set in motion carried that idea to the frozen sea of diplomatic nostrums the neapolitans are turning to victor emmanuel as the only man to save them from anarchy and civil war plunder and massacre and licitous foreign soldiery and a degraded mob after stating many suggested solutions and the objection to each he writes it is not then my sympathies with italy but my sympathy with the british interests which lead me in the face of existing circumstances to advocate the least prejudicial of these various issues the unity of italy the interests of italy turn naturally rather towards germany than france provided germany will allow her there is no reason why austria should not give a real efficient protection to italy they have great interests in common and they have a common danger france but then this protection should be a moral one not such an interest as rudolph of Habsburg tried to create in italy by corrupt bargain with rome it should be a protection shared by england and prussia with no other guarantee no other pact than that which springs from natural necessities shared in common and felt by all if austria would consent to cede venice she would find security compensation and safety she would establish her finances and gain a barrier on her western frontier which would be impregnable so long as england is mistress of the sea such a league of austria prussia italy and england argues hudson would put an end to all our fears of french hegemony in view of the argument used by hudson in this letter in favor of italian unity compare the letter of lord palmerston on january tenth eighteen sixty one upon the subject of italy your majesty reminds viscount palmerston that he stated last summer that it would be better for the interests of england that southern italy should be a separate monarchy rather than it should form part of a united italy 
viscount balmerson still retains that position because a separate kingdom of the two sicilies would be more likely in the event of war between england and france to side at least by its neutrality with the strongest naval power and it's to be hoped that such power would be england but then it would be necessary that the twin sicilies as an independent and separate state should be well governed and should have an enlightened sovereign this unfortunately has become hopeless and impossible under the bourbon dynasty and no englishman could wish to see a marat or a prince napoleon on the throne of naples the course of events since last summer seems to have finally decided the fate of sicily and naples there can be no doubt that for the interest of the people of italy and with a view to the general balance of power in europe a united italy is the best arrangement the italian kingdom will never side with france from partiality to france and the stronger the kingdom becomes the better able it will be to resist political coercion from france the chief hold that france will have upon the policy of the kingdom of italy consists in the retention of venetia by austria august eleventh elliot to russell garibaldi still on sicilian side of straits of messina villa marina told me this morning but again swore me to secrecy that victor emmanuel has just received a letter from prince napoleon saying that the time has come for securing the independence of italy courage on your part is all that is now required but elliot adds that the piedmontese government frightened of the men around garibaldi have instructed villa marina to do all he can to prevent garibaldi from coming over but without letting it appear as if piedmont was doing so the object in this is to get a revolution in naples for annexation without a garibaldian dictatorship but elliot prophesies correctly that the neapolitans have so little pluck that the attempt to anticipate garibaldi will fail august twentieth elliot to russell garibaldi just crossing the straits the only tolerable situation which i see remaining is that there should be war between naples and sardinia the former dare not quarrel and i am afraid the latter may continue to think it more profitable to go on working underground but open war would be infinitely more credible and it would avoid the dangers both of messianism and reaction through which we shall otherwise have to pass if this were to be done naples would be settled but we should then have the affairs of rome and venetia which must arise out of the annexation of naples if the neapolitans shook off their king for themselves it is perhaps possible that they might be induced to be satisfied with the second son of victor emmanuel but there is little chance of their doing their work for themselves and those who do it will impose the new arrangement on them viz annexation august twenty fourth hudson to russell the expeditions of garibaldi have ceased bonafide and as the fine weather has set in the country people are thinking more of their harvest than politics turin is deserted the king is in the mountains shooting chamois and nearly all the diplomats are gone too and cavour was meanwhile making his final arrangements for the invasion of the papal states i wonder whether hudson really knew this september first elliot to russell from naples six days before garibaldi entered naples narrates discovery of what is called count trapani's reactionary plot which has led to the resignation of the constitutional ministers but their resignation is not yet accepted the national guards almost insist on the ministry remaining in and say that if it does so the tranquillity of the town will be guaranteed by them but the ministers or rather di martino insist on going and say that if the king becomes privy to plots for their arrest which was part of the program of trapani's plot they cannot remain in to please the national guard or to become the government not of the king but of the people in a few hours it must be settled one way or the other i cannot yet give any true details of this plot but the french connection of the leaders both of it and of count aquila's is a remarkable feature the most prominent man in the present one is prince castropiano and prince ishitella is also said to be in it and both of these men i pointed out to you as devoted to french interests it was also a frenchman in whose rooms the compromising papers were found 
and I believe Brenier has called for his liberation. In fact, on all sides there is an atmosphere of intrigue that bewilders me. September 7th, Hudson to Russell, day of Garibaldi's entry into Naples, a few days prior to Cavour's invasion of Papal States. Cavour must choose between one of the horns of his dilemma, either intervention with Victor Emmanuel or anarchy with Garibaldi. Of course, he chooses for the former, but we see now what the Garibaldi expedition has produced. Cavour told me this morning that he would willingly have avoided all this, but being determined not to let Garibaldi and the Mazzanians get the whip hand, he is forced to resort to extreme measures in order to avoid the Venetian difficulty. When I read your dispatch to him this morning, he said, Believe me, Garibaldi shall not attack Venice. If Venice is ever attacked, it will be by an Italian army. I have no intention of attacking Venice, and this Lord John may rely on. This appears to mean he will attack Venice when he is strong enough to do so, but that day appears to me to be distant. October 16th, Elliot to Russell, a fortnight after the Battle of the Volturno. General Tour, who is Garibaldi's right hand, says that the town of Naples furnished eighty fighting men to Garibaldi's army of 20,000 Italian volunteers at the front protecting Naples. October 30th, Elliot to Russell. Last days of Garibaldi's dictatorship. No change of any kind has taken place here since I last wrote, except that the necessity of having a government becomes daily more and more apparent, and each day adds immensely to the difficulty that will be experienced in setting matters a little straight after the universal and wholesale plunder and confusion, which is by degrees becoming a system. October 19th, Hudson to Russell. Victor Manuel advancing from Ancona to Naples. The king has sent me through the general Soroli a message to the following effect, that considering the jealousy with which his constitutional system of government is regarded by most sovereigns, and especially by Austria, Russia, and France, and the lukewarm support of Prussia, he has no one to rely on for moral support save England, and he would esteem it as a favor if on his arrival at Naples he could be supported by a British representative. The moral support was forthcoming in Lord John Russell's famous dispatch of October 27th. It contained the sentiment. It appears that the late proceedings of the King of Sardinia have been strongly disapproved by several of the principal courts of Europe. But Her Majesty's government must admit that the Italians themselves are the best judges of their own interests. The publication of this dispatch produced in Italy the effect recorded in the following letters. November 2nd, Hudson to Russell. Cavour begs me to make you his warmest acknowledgments for your dispatch, number 195. Yesterday it would have done your heart good could you have seen him read your number 195. He shouted, rubbed his hands, jumped up, sat down again. Then he began to think, and when he looked up, tears were standing in his eyes. Behind your dispatch he saw the Italy of his dreams, the Italy of his hopes, the Italy of his policy. November 12th, Elliot to Russell. For the past week, Naples and I, we leave Italy, have been more occupied about your dispatch to Hudson than about anything else. And though you must have been in great measure prepared for it, you can hardly quite have expected the immense sensation it has made. Villa Marina's first exclamation was that it was worth more than 100,000 men, and King Victor Emmanuel appears to have spoken to Admiral Mundy in terms almost as strong. November 16th, Cavour to Russell, thanking him for the dispatch. Le pi moral que vous nos prêtez de cette constance prima, nous permettra, j'espère, d'establir sur des bases larges solides l'édifice de la nation italienne. Ma viva reconnaissance pour le service immense que vous venez de rendre à l'Italie. Mr. Otto Russell to Lord John Russell. Rome, December 1st, 1860. My dear uncle, Ever since your famous dispatch of the 27th, you are blessed night and morning by twenty millions of Italians. I could not read it myself without deep emotion, and the moment it was published in Italian, 
thousands of people copied it from each other to carry it to their homes and weep over it for joy and gratitude in the bosom of their families away from brutal mercenaries and greasy priests difficult as the task is the italians have now before them i cannot but think that they will accomplish it better than we any of us hope for every day convinces me more and more that i am living in the midst of a great and real national movement which will at last be crowned with perfect success notwithstanding the legion of enemies italy still counts in europe your affectionate nephew odo russell while this book is being printed in nineteen eleven an important document has come to hand through the kindness of mr william warren vernon who finds in his diary under the date february twenty second eighteen seventy the following contemporary entry reached the hotel vittoria at san remo at five thirty we dined with lord and lady russell who live close by lord russell is looking very well lakita he and lady russell discussed how in july eighteen sixty when persini was trying to induce lord john to stop garibaldi's landing in italy from messina he lakita being very ill at the time managed to see lady john who was ill in bed she however received him and sent for lord john who was mightily surprised to find lakita there who immediately attacked him on the treaty he was supposed to be arranging with persini to have an anglo-french fleet in the straits of messina to prevent garibaldi from crossing to italy after a long discussion which nearly exhausted tino who was very ill lord john said to him go to bed and don't be so sure that i'm going to sign the treaty yet tino went home to bed and two hours after george elliot then lord john's secretary came to tell him from lord john to be of good cheer tino took the hint sent for diazelio and dictated a telegram to cavour implying that the intended treaty was at an end garibaldi was accordingly undisturbed how few people knew that this was owing to lakita i myself heard lord john russell confirm the story this passage from mr vernon's diary puts the story beyond all possible doubt by proving that lord and lady russell bore out lakita's account of it with the hudson letter the chain of evidence is now complete appendix b expeditions of volunteers from north italy who joined garibaldi after the first sailing of the thousand in may on may twenty fourth leaving genoa was the utile approximate number of men on board was sixty under anetta chiefly arms and ammunition leaving genoa on the night of june eighth and ninth the utile the second voyage along with charles and jane the american clipper had nine hundred or a thousand men under corte was captured at sea and taken to gaeta released and came out again in the amazon which left genoa july fifteenth they were just in time for the battle of milazzo the following is medici's expedition which had close on twenty five hundred men with eight thousand firearms and much ammunition on the night of june ninth and tenth the washington french steamer belonging to the massageries imperiales left genoa with twelve hundred or fourteen hundred with medici in person paired and the marios on board on the night of june ninth and tenth organ french steamer left with two hundred and nine under caldesi some estimate a little higher on june tenth from leghorn the franklin amsterdam french steamer left genoa with eight hundred men under malancini on june twenty ninth the medea left genoa with three hundred and sixty five or six hundred and fifty men under fazioli the following is cosent's expedition with over two thousand on july second the washington left genoa on their second voyage with one thousand two hundred and seventy with cosent's in person also on july second the province left genoa with seven hundred and seventy men on board on july seventh the oregon left genoa on the second voyage with four hundred and four men under sicoli on july ninth the province left genoa on her second voyage with seven hundred and sixty five men under kerchi on july ninth salmon left genoa with five hundred and twenty six men under vacacheri on july tenth isere with four hundred and seven men under chiravenga left genoa 
on july tenth or the eleventh city of aberdeen left genoa with nine hundred men under strambio on july fifteenth the amazon a british ship left genoa with the men of cortes gaeta battalion on board on july sixteenth the province on its third voyage left genoa with four hundred and five men under casaro on july eighteenth Chita de torino a large steamer formerly belonging to chia transatlantica left with fifteen hundred and thirty five men under sachi on july twenty first the franklin left genoa on the second voyage with five hundred and sixty four men under gobi on july twenty first or twenty second the amazon left genoa on her second voyage with about three hundred and ninety men under bertie on july twenty third Isseri on the second voyage left genoa with four hundred and thirteen men or four hundred and twenty three on july sixth or the eighth the province left genoa on her fourth voyage with two hundred and eleven men under pietro cortez on july tenth to the fifteenth Isera's third voyage left genoa with the amazon Vizzotine, and chita di torino with approximately eighteen hundred men on board these ships carried approximately three thousand seven hundred and eight men on board leaving genoa on about august the eleventh and reaching calgary by august fifteenth were the general garibaldi carrying six hundred and eighty men the r d shepherd an american ship carrying approximately fifteen hundred men leaving from spezia and reaching calgary on august fifteenth was the weasel an english ship carrying approximately thirty two men on august sixteenth the sydney hall left genoa with five hundred and forty two men on august twentieth the province on her fifth voyage left genoa with approximately five hundred and eighty two men on september first through the third from fabo leghorn the garibaldi polici and san nicola departed with two thousand men these various expeditions together make a total of about twenty one thousand men besides the ships in the above list which took them in south there were many other ships engaged in carrying arms and stores as the large queen of england and the independence the small ferret and badger which together with the weasel in the list above were the five steamers bought by bertani's central committee we also find mention of the ships spitazione and colonello sacchi taking out stores in the milan m s s archivo bertani plici li live the expeditions of june and july especially those of medici and cosense were fitted out paid for and sent mainly by the corvarian national society and by the million rifles fund financed for the purpose by the government itself but the larger expeditions of august were fitted out and paid for and sent mainly by bertani's central committee and the more advanced parties who also bought the queen of england the independence and the ferret and the badger steamers used only for carrying arms from genoa and therefore not mentioned in the above list appendix c the rival organizations that helped garibaldi one the list of seventeen cities where bertani's committee had local committees runs as follows modena parma forli bologna reggio ferrara piacenza florence leghorn faenza ravenna rimini cuneo brescia bergamo cremona and milan i do not think that the list is complete but it seems to show that the committee was active in lombardy tuscany and the romagna and to a less extent in piedmont the covarian national society whose seat was in turin was most active of all the cities of piedmont but it also had a very active local committee in the towns of romagna not excluding those in which there were also local committees of bertani's in tuscany the committee initiated in may by amari and malincini worked hard in conjunction with la farina and medici quarrelling with bertani second the accounts of bertani's committee are given in bertani reso they were most scrupulously kept and stood the audit as bertani's critics readily admit the total sum received was six million two hundred and one and sixty lira thirteen cent but of this sum five sixths was sent to bertani by garibaldi five million one hundred and six thousand six hundred and fifty five lira forty five cent from sicily 
and 201,632 lira, 5 cent from Naples. In this way, Sicily was made to pay for the liberation of Naples, as the price of its own liberation, for it was the 5 million lira from Sicily that principally paid for Pianciani's great expeditions in August, equipped by Bertani. Garibaldi had been lucky enough to capture from the Bourbon government an immense quantity of treasure in the Secca or Mint of Palermo when he took the town. They had, by great good luck for Garibaldi, been calling in old money to make a recoinage. A large part of the five million from Sicily came from this source. The total of the private subscriptions received by Bertani's committee amounts to 851,735 lira 28 cents. The subscription list, including the sums from 150 upwards, is given in full in Bertani's Resso. The Cavorian National Society and the Million Rifles Fund probably drew subscriptions from richer classes on the average and were more patronized by the municipalities voting rates to help Garibaldi. The National Society received and spent over one million lira. The Million Rifles Fund, besides many thousands of rifles and muskets, supplied more than two million lira. Of these two millions, a large part was furnished by subscription, or out of municipal rates, and another large part by the royal government. The royal government, through the agency of the National Society, itself secretly paid for the arms brought to Garibaldi by Angenta, in the Utile on its first voyage. Since the Utile left Genoa on May 24th, before the taking of Palermo, we have here evidence that Cavour financially assisted Garibaldi's expedition before its initial success was assured. Mr. Nelson Gay has proved this from documents in his possession in his article from the Deutsche Review, December 1910, page 313. Appendix D. The State of Sicily under the Dictator and his Pro-Dictators this is an obscure subject and i'm not aware of any work of careful historical research dealing with it the noise that was made about the outbreak of social war at bronte shows that these disturbances were local and exceptional they were very promptly suppressed by bixio the history of the march of eber's column through the heart of sicily from june twentieth to july fifteenth recorded in great detail in the times morning post at amoli tours division abbey Knot, and elsewhere shows on the whole a peaceable state of society in the villages considering that they were in process of revolution some banditti complained of by the villagers were arrested by the garibaldini but from amari's letter of august third quoted below one would gather that the country grew more disturbed near Palermo at the beginning of August. La Farina himself admits that, in spite of the disorder, the taxes and duties are paid. But he is no doubt right in complaining that there was still considerable disorder and delay in the work of the magistracy, police and judicature of the island within a month of the taking of Palermo. It will be well to record the impressions of several impartial and well-informed persons, one, the British consul Goodwin, who had been many years in the island, and was perhaps the man most generally trusted there, reported to his government that peace and order in Palermo as early as June 11th were far better than the state of things after the revolution of 1848, which he had witnessed. In no subsequent passage in his political journal or official correspondence for the year does he complain of a lapse towards anarchy, either in Palermo or in the island. 2. Mikola Amari, a most impartial observer, a moderate Cavourian, who was in his native island from the beginning of July onwards, writes on July 3rd, In Palermo nothing is heard of the thefts, homicides, and other violent acts of 1848. I can affirm this. They have, until a few days ago, continued to kill some of the ex-police agents, but the case is exceptional. It is bad, certainly, but does not prove anarchy. On July 6th, he writes, If I am not mistaken, the condition of the country is far from anarchy, as some cry out, seeing there is neither the order of quiet times nor authority in the proper hands. In Palermo, though the week before I came one of Manny Scalco's ex-police agents was killed, there is complete security of person and property. Business is conducted as usual. 
people frequent the streets until late at night up country there are perhaps local parties with their quarrels and revenges but i have not heard recently of any spilling of blood and i hope that gradual order will recover its natural balance a month later on august third he writes less hopefully of every sort of disorder in the provinces though in palermo there is security and tranquillity as in the time of peace in the provinces the stupid local parties tear each other to pieces ambitious of power vain and greedy in some places they come to blows and the robbers let out from the prisons feast and riot in the countryside particularly in the district of palermo there is ample provision under the laws but who enforces them the governors of the districts and provinces have done badly with a few exceptions the national guard through fault of the governors or owing to municipal quarrels is powerless to combat the robberies and acts of violence he very wisely says that nothing but a strong force of gendarmes from the north neither sicilian nor neapolitan can enforce order in the island this was one of the strongest arguments for an early annexation three tour though he served garibaldi well was almost as much of cavour's as of garibaldi's party and was bitterly attacked by bertani's friends but in july he wrote to the papers to protest against la farina's interference in sicily la farina tour wrote depicts sicily in prey to anarchy and declares that the setting up of the national guard was opposed in every way this is false tour says that there was no ill feeling between parties in palermo till la farina came and stirred it up and that it died down after his departure four nievo one of the thousand remained at palermo from june to december as military intendant supplying garibaldi's armies he saw the inside of sicily all that year he was an honorable and an intellectual man though he cannot like amari and tour be called impartial as between garibaldi and cavour for whatever his opinion was worth he wrote on october sixteenth pay no attention to the talk about anarchy here order is perfect as it never was before in sicily five the time special correspondent eber the hungarian writing from castro giovanni in the middle of the island on july tenth says garibaldi from the first moment of his arrival in sicily has adopted the policy of leaving the internal administration of the country in the hands of sicilians and every day shows that he was right in this measure for in the great general greediness of employees the nomination of any one but sicilians would have been looked upon as an intrusion it is only justice to say that in spite of this office hunt public tranquillity has not suffered in more than three or four communes in the whole island and even in these the disturbances happened before the regular government was established in all the rumors of disturbances which you hear there is not a word of foundation and this is perhaps the greatest of all the wonders which garibaldi has achieved since his arrival in sicily for to his prestige alone must this be attributed appendix e the arms of the campaign the following three statements can be made with confidence one that practically the whole of the bourbon infantry were armed with rifles two that the thousand except the genoese carabineers had smooth-bore muskets of an obsolete pattern three that after the arrival of medici at palermo one part of the garibaldini had rifles and another part smooth-bore muskets the doubtful problem is whether among the garibaldini the rifles were the general rule and the muskets the exception or vice versa i will place before the reader all the pieces of evidence which i have been able to collect on this point one my friend mr j a dalmage an officer in the british army both before and after eighteen sixty was on leave from his regiment and travelling sicily in eighteen sixty he joined garibaldi's forces in june was unofficially attached to tours brigade saw most of the fighting in the campaign and was professionally well fit to speak on its technical side he sends me the following notes smoothbore the thousand were armed with military smoothbore muskets these had evidently been sold as obsolete by piedmont and other european countries and could be purchased very cheaply i should think 
the sicilian and calabrian volunteers were armed with smoothbore muskets many of these being weapons which had been disposed of by our own army and the east india company they were purchased for probably from ten to fourteen shillings apiece the smoothbore weapon was not at all an unsuitable firearm for the tactics of garibaldi which was to get as quickly as possible to close quarters with the enemy when the bayonet became of use these muskets were sighted up to three hundred yards but after the first hundred yards or so it was quite a matter of chance if men hit what they aimed at on the other hand the rifle was not of service to a soldier until he had been properly trained to use it the squadre the sicilian irregular bands had a very primitive and curious gun of their own it could make a noise and kill bird or man but at no very great distance it was not in any way suited for a bayonet and was fired by means of a percussion cap rifle the men of peard's company were armed with revolving rifles colt an american the inventor of this weapon had presented one hundred of these to garibaldi not only were they troublesome to load but the user in firing would sometimes have his left wrist badly scorched from the breech the colt's revolving rifle was the only thing like a breech loader in garibaldi's army medici's expedition brought the first enfield rifles major wolf received one hundred and thirty five of these for his foreign company and they were the only rifles of any kind with eber's brigade in sicily though it was of course a muzzle loader the enfield was an excellent rifle and was sighted up to nine hundred yards the men of Cozant's brigade whom i met at Milazzo, were in possession of enfields the english legion had them also i should say too that others had been placed in the hands of the best italian volunteers neapolitan army the bourbon forces were very well equipped and armed they were strong in cavalry and had excellent artillery also at the operations before capua they had several rifled field pieces very unusual at that time the infantry soldiers were armed with a good serviceable mini rifle with a large bore this bore struck me as so large that i made inquiry on the subject and was told that the weapons were muskets which had been sent to austria to have the barrels grooved and so converted into rifles i do not however vouch for the truth of this story the cacciatori light infantry sharpshooters in fact had a shorter rifle but with the same bore there were several regiments of cacciatori which were looked on as picked troops it is possible that there may have been smooth-bore muskets in the neapolitan army but i never saw any in sicily on such occasions as the surrenders at palermo and Milazzo, the neapolitans marched out with their arms which they retained by agreement in calabria however where many surrenders took place the arms must have been handed over to our people but i do not know what became of them nor whether any were given over for use to our volunteers we took a large number of prisoners on the first and second of october and several thousand stand of arms thus came into the possession of garibaldi's people but as capua surrendered during the first days of november following these came to us a little late for use two mr a b patterson writes to me dunes men were certainly armed with enfield rifles i remember my own perfectly i believe all the men in medici's command were so armed it is problematic that dune sicilians a regiment which of course had little training should have been selected for arming with rifles in preference to the pick troops of which medici's command was mainly composed most of these had been in service in eighteen fifty nine either under garibaldi or in the sardinian army my belief is that rifles were the rule at Milazzo. probably only the newly raised squadre who were not i think engaged at Milazzo, were armed with smooth bores i may add that dunes men had no target practice at palermo they had blank cartridge practice only so they were not able to make the best use of their weapons but it did not matter much everywhere the contest was decidedly at close quarters the enemy was so sheltered by walls trees etc that we did not see him until very near and the firing was mainly at close quarters success was obtained by the constant determined advance always under heavy fire 
and against a brave enemy in a strong position, superior in numbers and, of course, in training. Only the heroic leading of Garibaldi and his lieutenants made the victory possible. I venture to claim Dune and Wyndham among the best of these. 3. In Times, August 4th, page 10, column 2. The special correspondent, who took part in the Battle of Milazzo, says that Medici's men were then armed with Enfield rifles. 4. Mariotti, a veteran of Malancini's regiment, the Tuscan part of Medici's expedition, which came out of the Franklin, in his detailed and generally accurate memoir, says, Our firearms were those of the Million Rifles Fund. Rifles come from America, small bore, with the barrels varnished black. They were technical perfection for that period. Mr. Dolmage says these are clearly the Enfields, and that Mariotti mistook in supposing they came from America. They came from England. 5. Captain C. S. Forbes, R.N., who arrived at Milazzo from Palermo within a few days of the battle, was familiar with Garibaldi and many of his principal followers, writes of the victors in that battle. Generally speaking, the entire force was armed with Enfields, but few knew how to develop the use of those deadly weapons, the sights being deemed a superfluity. But he adds, a musket or rifle, sixty rounds of ammunition, a water bottle, and for the most part an empty haversack, and you have the impedimenta of a Garibaldian. 6. Gurdzoni speaks of Medici as bringing with him to Palermo in June 8,000 carbine rigate, or English rifles. But in a footnote on the same page, the list supplied by Gustala, the secretary of the Million Rifles Fund, we read of 4,850 faculi francese, 200 carbine enfield, 200 fiduci de ligre. Now the word fucili may either mean rifles or smooth bores. 7. Fincy, a director of the Million Rifles Fund, in his letter of September 6, 1869, says that the directors had given the preference to French fucili model of 1842, which that government had abandoned, but which had done good service in the campaign of 1859, besides fucili of the Prussian army, which had also been changed. The directors had also obtained a good number of carbini and Austrian rifles, besides 2,000 new Enfield carabini. This leads me to suppose that the statement in Gorsoni's note about 200 Enfields is a misprint for 2,000, especially as in that case the numbers 4,850 plus 2,000 plus 200 would amount to something near the 8,000 spoken of in Gersoni's text. Later in his letter, Fincy speaks of 200 excellent Austrian rifles and 3,744 Prussian fucili as the property of the fund. 8. Medici himself, in his letter to Garibaldi, uses the ambiguous term 8,000 fucili, but he speaks of 10,000 fucili e molte munizioni, oltre le carabini in field, destinati ad amare la mia spedizione, over and above the Enfield rifles destined to an army my own expedition, which consisted of 2,500 men. 9. In the letters of the ministers to de Azeglio about the weapons in the Million Rifles Fund armory at Milan, the ambiguous word fucili is employed. 10. After the Battle of Milazzo, the British steamer, Queen of England, brought to Garibaldi's camp at Faro, on August 15th, a few days before he crossed the Straits of Messina, 23,500 Enfield rifles from England in 1,175 cases and several rifled cannon. This bears out Times, August 23rd, page 9, C4, and Forbes 141. The rifled cannon were not used in Calabria, but there were rifled cannon at the Volturno on both sides. Putting together these various pieces of evidence, I am inclined to believe that Medici's and Cosent's men and Dune's regiment were at the Battle of Milazzo armed with good rifles, which they had not yet learned to use properly, but that most of Eber's column and a great many of the Sicilians and subsequently the Calabrians were armed with smooth bores. Appendix F Battle of Milazzo 1. 
here i give a list of the principal authorities which i have studied for this battle in traversing this and all my other accounts of actions in the campaign if critics find one or another of these authorities going counter to statements in the text they must bear in mind that in points of military detail even first-hand authorities and eye-witnesses contradict each other not infrequently and that therefore i have been forced in collating the different accounts to come to a separate conclusion on each incident deciding in each several case in favor of one authority and against another for reasons which it would take a separate volume to set out in full in the general aspects of the strategy and tactics there is much less difficulty especially when the ground has been visited a bourbon first-hand authorities the first of bosco's long reports can be found in cronaca 207 to 209 a second later one originally printed in the neapolitan revista militaire august eighteen sixty can be found reprinted in three places palmieri page thirty and forty to forty six nova messi twenty three to twenty five and gusti milano august twentieth to the twenty first eighteen sixty translated back again from a french version Zerilli, document five gives a letter from bourbon officer de Sivio, section three pages three thirteen through three seventeen and franchi section one pages seventy three through seventy six are second hand drawn from bosco's report b garibaldi and first hand authorities r medici times august fourth eighteen sixty piaggia the best authority on the topography Zerilli, Milazzo, Mistrales, Denen, Castellini, Mario Mac, and Redshirt, Guerzoni, Morning Post, August 9, 1860, Milan, Manuscript, Cosenz and Bruzzi, and Bronsetti, Section 1, page 3, Nelson, Manuscript, in my hands, Rome, Manuscript, Savi, Mancini, Paluici's Correro, Paird's Journal Manuscript, and Cornhill, Branaccio, Brandi, Uzzili, Mariotti, and Favielli, for Mancinini's defeat on left wing, Pozzi, Durand, Breger, for Bice, Magni Forbes arrived just after the battle, as did Mr. Dolmage, Mario, and Piaggia, Milazzo, Campo, page 136-137, through 137, and Baroni for Cortes Gaeta Battalion, I have also had the great advantage of conversations with Missouri, Cancio, Tedaldi, and Scalvo, and my own countrymen Patterson and Dalmage. See Appendix E above on arms used in the battle. Good second-hand authorities are Valari Cosp Tours Division, Rusto. 2. The Numbers on Both Sides In no case may the numbers be calculated from statements made by the opposite side, the Bourbon generals officially state that their force in Milazzo at 122 officers and 4,514 men. That was the total number of men against whom Garibaldi had to act. But of those, about 1,000 were the normal garrison of Milazzo Castle. The infantry of this garrison did not take part in the fighting outside the walls of the fortress on July 20th, but lent 100 men to help carry off the wounded bosco's expeditionary force making up the rest of the four thousand five hundred and fourteen men and one hundred and twenty two officers and therefore over rather than under three thousand consisted of three battalions of cacciatori first eighth and ninth regiments the crack troops of the neapolitan army together with a mountain battery of eight pieces and a squadron of cavalry all arms were first-rate troops and behaved well on july twentieth if bosco did not use all these troops of his own force excluding the garrison it was his own fault and his statement that only sixteen hundred of them took part in the battle is a quibble for in the same sentence he admits that nine hundred more formed the reserve and that some of these did actually fire a few shots also in both his reports he complains that the reserve were sent into action too early by lieutenant colonel mara so that he had no reserve at the critical moment besides this reserve he says that he also kept four hundred men on the peninsula behind the town to sum up 
bosco admits that twenty five hundred men were under his orders in the plain in front of the castle of which sixteen hundred were in the front line and the remaining nine hundred the reserve and that the reserve was all taken into action by lieutenant colonel mara above in the castle was a garrison of one thousand infantry and gunners the latter fired effectively at the garibaldini when they reached the bridge and there were four hundred more cacciatori in the peninsula not engaged the garibaldini whom bosco reported sometimes at eight sometimes at twelve thousand did not on july twentieth reach more than fifty seven hundred at the highest serious estimate and were probably nearer four thousand or five thousand the best garibaldian writers generally calculate the total as four thousand or as high as fifty five hundred or fifty seven hundred it is impossible to tell which is nearest the truth on account of the absence of any official statistics and on account of the variety in the estimates made of the various bodies of irregulars from north italy and sicily of which the army was composed each of these bodies was usually called a battalion but no battalion contained over nine hundred men and some were as low as three hundred or less the following table which mentions i believe every one of these bodies present at the battle of milazzo will at least serve to show the difficulty of calculating the numbers of the garibaldian army from these lists i should be inclined to place it somewhere between the two estimates of four thousand and fifty five hundred medici's force with which he left palermo numbered eighteen hundred men according to medici dune sicilians numbered six hundred speeches so-called salieri battalion four hundred men genoese carabineers eighty two or eighty five or one hundred and fifty cortez gaeta battalion numbered five hundred men or six hundred according to medici nine hundred was the number of the original expedition from genoa captured at gaeta but some remained at genoa after the return from gaeta paird's company revolving rifles too small ever to be called a battalion was thirty according to nelson's manuscript sprovieri's battalion three hundred or four hundred vacheri's battalion three hundred borelli's and montovani's half battalions carrero sicilians curzoni sicilians no estimate is anywhere given of the numbers of these four bodies but they were spoken of as quite small carrero's men fought hard and had no casualties in the battle besides these bodies engaged in the battle there were fabrizi's three hundred sicilians who were not on the field at all but were sent to guard the road from messina against a possible attack by the fifth cacciatori who were occupying gesso and rizzo cavalry garibaldi had none bosco had a squadron who played an important part on both wings artillery against bosco's mountain battery of eight pieces all of which did great execution and over forty pieces of different kinds mounted on the castle walls garibaldi had two ridiculous pieces dragged by hand which were brought into action late in the day on the bridge for a few minutes and withdrawn as useless but the cannon on the tukery assisted him towards the close of the day three losses there are no precise statistics but the best informed garibaldian authorities estimate their loss in killed and wounded on july twentieth at seven hundred and fifty or eight hundred medici twenty nine mistrales dien six hundred and twenty two rusto two hundred and nineteen peaggia fifty six calculates eight hundred and gives an interesting list of those tended in barcelona times august fourth page ten column four mengini two hundred and twenty five Cremona manuscript Carassi. The Neapolitan loss every one agreed to have been much less. Bosco placed it as low as one hundred and sixteen killed and wounded. But Cronaca, two hundred and eight, he also mentions thirty one missing, besides a dozen more killed and wounded. It may be noted that the Gionesi Carabineers had forty four men killed or wounded in the battle, out of a total of eighty five. Cortes Gaeta Battalion lost fourteen or seventeen out of thirty or thirty two officers. Appendix G Date of Landings in Calabria 1. The Date of Garibaldi's Landing. Big Seal's Dispatch by a Slip of the Pen, 
gives the date of the crossing as the night of august nineteenth twentieth whereas it was really the night of august eighteenth and nineteenth this has misled many historians since for example the author of tours division one hundred and thirty two castellini page fifty two note two and de cesare himself bixion fact makes his own error patent to any one who reads his dispatch with special care for the dispatch is not consistent with itself he says that they entered reggio before dawn on august twenty first after having passed the calabria two full days with a night in between them not only bixio but garibaldi and other members of the expedition agree that after landing at dawn they spent first one whole day then one whole night and then another whole day before making the night attack on reggio that attack was made on the night of august twentieth and twenty first after midnight therefore they must have landed at dawn on august nineteenth not at dawn on august twentieth that they crossed in the night of august eighteenth landing at dawn on august nineteenth is expressly stated by the following first-hand authorities mengini four fifty one paired manuscript journal August eighteenth, nineteenth, Arabini, section two, page one hundred and one hundred and one, Duran Brager, one seventy one, Times, August twenty fifth, page nine, column five, where the correspondent writing on August nineteenth describes the departure from Giardini on the previous evening, the eighteenth, Castellini fifty two, text the modern note being in error, and the Neapolitan dispatches of the date, P and L. 45 and 46 which alone would be conclusive but once the inconsistency in bixio's dispatch has been detected and the necessary emendation made it may be said that all the first-hand authorities who give any dates at all agree that the landing was at dawn of august nineteenth the second-hand authorities are mostly wrong having followed the error in bixio's dispatch two date of cosense landing Cosenz crossed from Faro at Favazina at dawn on August 22nd, according to Orsini, 53, on August 20th, according to Maison, 44. Both are wrong. He landed on the morning of August 21st, while Garibaldi was taking Reggio. This is proved by the date of the Neapolitan dispatches in P&L, 52 and 56, by Morizzani, 105, Mangini 276, and Times, September 4th, page 7, column 3. Some of these authorities describe the flotilla as starting overnight, others at dawn, others not till 8 in the morning. The Times says that the boats left the Faro in two batches, which may partly account for this inconsistency. What is certain is that Cosent's force landed at Favazina on the morning of August 21st. Appendix H. Immediate Causes of the Evacuation of Salerno The decision to recall the troops from Salerno was taken, according to De Sivo, Section 5, page 39, and Franchi, Section 1, page 113, not earlier than the evening of September 5th, and in consequence of the complaints of Marshal Rivera at Salerno, to the effect that Garibaldi would assail him the next day, and he was afraid of being captured in his bed. This is valuable as indicating that Marshal Rivera's complaints of the situation at Salerno influenced the decision at Naples. But the hour is not perhaps quite accurate. The telegram from the commander-in-chief in Naples to Marshal Rivera, ordering him to retreat from Salerno, is dated Naples 2 a.m., presumably September 5th. Whether the hour of this important telegram is correctly printed or not, it is certain that the actual retreat was begun in time for the Garibaldini to hear news of it, whilst at dinner at Oletta on the 5th. It appears, therefore, that the final decision to abandon Naples and to withdraw Rivera from Salerno was taken in the morning of September 5th, as a result of the telegrams, alarums, and excursions of the night of September 4th and 5th, during which night a last reunion of ministers was held at night until dawn and during which forbes and galena were pouring their false telegrams into naples and salerno one of these is printed in monier page two seventy three galena two name of recipient not given eboli one thirty a m september fifth 
Caldarelli's brigade has passed over to Garibaldi. Four thousand men commanded by Tour have landed at Sapri. Other landings will be effected nearer to us. In Forbes, 225, the Arrivabene, section 2, 168, Galenga's other telegram to Uola, Naples, is given thus. Eboli, 11.30 p.m., Garibaldi has arrived with 5,000 of his own men and 5,000 Calabrese are momentarily expected. Disembarkations are expected in the Bay of Naples and Gulf of Salerno tonight. I strongly advise you to withdraw the garrison from the latter place without delay, or they will be cut off. And let me beg of you as a personal friend but a political enemy to abandon a sinking cause which must be your ruin. Forbes, 226, writes, on my subsequent arrival at Naples, I learned from one of the ex-ministers that the fact of the telegram being addressed to Uola by a private friend was what gave color to the whole proceeding. Paird's telegram sent the same night, September 4th and 5th, to Salerno are also said to have caused Marshal Rivera to write to Naples, demanding his own withdrawal from a position which he regarded as untenable. Di Martino, then minister of Francis II, told Arriva Bene, that such was the effect produced by Peard's telegram. Also, in Revels de Acona, 65, we read a letter of Revels dated October 23, 1860, Isernia, setting down what a Bourbon officer just captured there had told him. The evidence seems first-hand and quite unprejudiced, as Revel knows nothing about Peard or his adventures. The Bourbon officer, so Revel writes, related to him that, in the first days of September he was with General Scotti at Salerno to resist the advance of Garibaldi, when he received a telegram from the head of the Giardemain at Eboli, which announced the imminent arrival of Garibaldi with 3,000 troops and 4,000 insurgents, and the defection of Caldarelli's brigade which had joined the Garibaldini. Scotti feared the attack of such superior forces and still more the contact of Caldarelli's men with his own as the harbinger of future defection. Sent the news to the ministers, proposing to retire on Nocera or Nola, if there were enough men in Naples. The ministry sent him orders to retire to Nola and thence to Capua. Later on he learnt that the telegram had been sent by a staff officer of Garibaldi's under the false signature of the Jardarm as a stratagem of war, but he was so preoccupied that he had not thought of verifying it. This explains how Garibaldi came to enter Salerno, then Naples. As a matter of fact, it was not Scotti, but Rivera who was in command at Salerno, though oddly enough, Paird at the time thought he was telegraphing to Scotti. In Monier, 273, the following telegram of Rivera is printed. Salerno, September 4th, 11 in the evening. The electric wire between Eboli and Salerno is broken. The two non-commissioned officers returning from Calabria have brought the news that the main body of Garibaldian revolutionists and the Caldarelli brigade have reached Auletta. I am sending by rail the two non-commissioned officers, Neam Burgo of the 15th line, and Guida of the fourth to see Colonel Ansani. This telegram is at first sight puzzling. It shows indeed that the exaggerated rumors about the defection of Caldarelli's brigade and the false rumors of the close propinquity of Garibaldi and his men due to Paird's game at Oletta and Iboli reached Marshal Rivera and deeply affected him. But it says nothing of any telegram from Eboli as the source of this information, which is attributed to two Bourbon sergeants. And the wire from Eboli is said to be broken an hour before midnight. But the explanation is clear. Rivera at Salerno wrongly thought that the wire was broken, because after Paird's entry into Eboli, the telegraph official was being brought before Paird, and the Eboli office was no longer being served. Paird's telegrams begin to pour into Salerno half an hour later, for the date of Galenga's telegram to Ula is 11.30 that night, and his telegram to the other friend in Naples is as late as 1.30 the next morning. Paird's and Galenga's telegrams were therefore sent off shortly before and shortly after midnight. This is quite consistent with Paird's and Forbes' account of the matter as they say that they did not enter Eboli until after dark, nine o'clock according to Paird, eleven o'clock according to Forbes. In short, 
Rivera at Salerno, soon after the time, eleven o'clock, when he had declared the wire from Eboli to be broken, found the communication restored and received the telegrams dictated by Paird. Appendix J Numbers of the Armies on the Volturno 1. The Bourbon Forces A. Total Bourbon Force North of the Volturno The late Senator General Primerano, who in 1860 was an officer in the Bourbon Army, told me that there must have been 50,000 behind the Volturno, including the garrisons of Gaeta and Capua. After the reorganization behind the Volturno, the regiments, he said, were very full, often amounted to 300 each, viz. three battalions of 1,000 each. This impression is fully borne out by the following calculation, based on Bourbon authorities only. Losses on October 1st and 2nd, killed and prisoners only, not wounded, 2,500. Taken in Capua on November 2nd, 11 or 8,000. Interned in Papal States November 8th, 17,000. Took part in subsequent defense of Gaeta, 21,000. These four categories are mutually exclusive and added together give a total of 50,000. If we consider that nearly 1,000 more were captured with Scotty near Acernia on October 20th, and that at least some others must have disbanded, unaccounted for under any of these categories, it will seem rather an underestimate to place the total force north of the Volturno at 50,000. The names of a large number of the regiments of which this force was composed will be found in Franchi, section 2, pages 260 and 61. 271 through 276, 328 through 329. B. The total force engaged in the battle of October 1st and 2nd. Here is perhaps more uncertainty. We can, however, calculate von Mitchell's force, the Bourbon left wing, accurately. The Swiss who attacked Bixio at Madaloni numbered 3,000 and Ruiz, men who took Castel Moroni and Caserta Vecchia on October 1st and lost 2,000 prisoners on October 2nd, numbered 5,000, enumerated by Ruiz himself. This brings von Mitchell's force, the Bourbon left wing, to 8,000, as Ruiz himself tells us. It is far more difficult to estimate the Bourbon right wing under Tabachi and Afan de Rivera and Rutici himself, which attacked San Angelo, San Maria, and San Tamaro. There is no authoritative statement like that of Ruiz for the other wing. De Civo, section 4, page 184 and 189, puts it at 4,500 against San Maria, and 4,500 against San Angelo, and 1,500 cavalry reserve, plus two squadrons of cavalry and cannon against San Tamaro, equals about 11,000 in all but this is likely to be an underestimate, just as the Garbaldian calculations, not quoted here, are likely to be overestimates. Some attempt at real calculation can be made from the official figures given by Franchi, where we find that this wing acknowledged a loss in killed and wounded of 1,000, and beyond all doubt it consists of five regiments and eight battalions of infantry, eight regiments of cavalry and dragoons and seven batteries of artillery. For every one of these made a return of losses under fire on October 1st. See Franchi, section 2, page 260. In view of General Primerano's statement as to the fullness of the regiments and battalions, it is difficult to see how five regiments plus eight battalions of infantry plus eight regiments of cavalry could be much below 20,000 and indeed it would be over 30,000 if every battalion and regiment of infantry was really up to strength. But if we put the Bourbon right wing tentatively at 20,000 and the left confidently at 8,000, we get 28,000 in all for the battle of October 1st and 2nd. In view of the official document printed in Franchi, section 2, page 260, and Ruiz's statement, I think 28,000 is a fair estimate. 2. The Garibaldian Forces a. Total of Garibaldian Forces in Sicily and the Mainland We have official evidence that at the time of the disbanding of Garibaldi's forces in November, 50,000 were paid off, viz. 7,000 in Sicily and 43,000 in the Mainland. 
but of these forty three thousand on the mainland only a third so garibaldi declared were ever under fire for with regard to the forty three thousand we must remember that one many were enrolled during october after the battle had been fought two many regiments even at the time of the break-up of the forces in november were only in the process of formation and had never been actually under arms three these new enrollments in the autumn were going on principally in calabria apulia and Basilicata, far from the scene of action four the grand total includes every one in garibaldi's pay viz all the troops doing garrison and patrol work in naples and the provinces five the grand total was composed at least half of irregular bands forces raised by private persons local militia etc six a large part of the nominal force was fraudulent men put down their names merely to draw food and pay or to be able to swagger about in uniform garibaldi's own words were one-third were present in the hour of battle and the other two-thirds only at payday and the dinner hour there is therefore no reason to suppose on account of the grand total of forty three thousand on the mainland and seven thousand in sicily that more than twenty thousand men were ever at the front on the volturno of the twenty thousand volunteers from north italy the backbone of the force many were in hospital and more in garrison or patrol work in the provinces but it is reasonable to suppose that well over ten thousand northerners were on the volturno and the names of the regiments engaged on october first confirm this view b total force of garibaldini engaged on october first this is almost as difficult to calculate as the number of their opponents i think it is agreed on all hands that except at the arches of the valley where bixio had five thousand six hundred and fifty three men against the three thousand swiss the garibaldini were outnumbered at all points in the mountains north of caserta sacchi had eighteen hundred men very slightly engaged and bronzetti at castel moroni had two hundred and eighty three who managed to delay for four hours the advance of ruiz five thousand san maria and san angelo and all those regions on the garibaldian left were defended against an attack of five regiments and eight battalions of infantry and several thousand cavalry probably not less than twenty thousand of all arms and possibly far more the garibaldian force in this part of the field which was all agree outnumbered consisted of the men under medici defending san angelo the men under milbitz defending san maria and the first san tomorrow and the reserves under tour brought up from caserta to san maria as the day went on corte in command of some lucanians and aversa took no more part in the battle and is not therefore to be counted the most probable enumeration of the garibaldian forces in the battle of october first seemed to me as follows under bixio at madaloni five thousand six hundred and fifty three men bronzetti at castel moroni two hundred and eighty three sacchi at san luicio eighteen hundred medici at san angelo four thousand milbitz at san maria and san tomorrow three thousand tour at caserta fifty six hundred this provides a total of twenty thousand three hundred and thirty six therefore if i had to guess at the numbers engaged on october first i should say twenty thousand garibaldini and twenty eight thousand royalists c garibaldian force on october second and piedmontese assistance in the fighting on october second stocco's calabrians and the piedmontese bersaglieri also took part having arrived at caserta from naples after the end of the fighting on october first there had been several score of piedmontese gunners helping to serve the guns at san maria and san angelo on october first but no infantry as had been sometimes erroneously alleged the regular infantry only came up for the fighting of october second near caserta they consisted of two companies of bersaglieri and two companies of the first regiment of the brigata del rey this is proved not only by all garibaldian sources but by the only official piedmontese source the reports printed in mamor's door mill section one pages fifty two through fifty five 
these troops had been sent to the bay of naples on board persano's ships as early as august when cavour hoped they might be useful if a spontaneous revolution took place in naples before garibaldi's arrival appendix k numbers in the castle fidardo campaign one north italian army a total force general fonti says that his army consisted of thirty three thousand men all told this was the total expeditionary force that liberated the marches and umbria and includes della rocca's and cialdini's corps b present at battle of castel fidardo 